Let's go to Arizona. Meanwhile, it is on the cusp of electing its first female senator in a race to fill retiring Senator Jeff Flake's U.S. Senate seat. Congresswoman Kirsten Sinema won the Democratic nomination, and she's going to be facing off against Republican Congresswoman Martha McSally, who defeated former state Senator Kelly Ward and former Sheriff Joe Arpaio in her bid for the GOP nomination. And there, Heidi, uh, well, President Trump didn't endorse in Arizona's U.S. Senate primary, but he did take a victory lap anyway. I'm not exactly sure. Posting to Twitter at 12.44 a.m. <laughs> Washington time, Martha McSally running in the Arizona primary for the U.S. Senate was endorsed by rejected Senator Jeff Flake and turned it down. A first. NBC News captured video of McSally reading and reacting to the president's tweet in which she appears to say, oh, no. Earlier, she refused to comment on Flake's service to the state. You're looking to replace Jeff Flake. Jeff Flake won his election here back in 2012, represented the state for 18 years. What do you think of Jeff Flake yeah, as a representative of the state? Today is about the next senator uh, for this state. So you guys can make the comparisons. Has he served the state well? Uh, you guys can sort that out. Well, uh, so uh, let's, uh, Heidi, obviously, there, I mean, the Republican Party has changed a great deal uh, since Donald Trump started running, since Donald Trump got elected. Uh, that's the sort of thing you would never see in the past, uh, where a, a candidate wouldn't even talk about a man who served his state honorably. Uh, uh, but... Um, Talk about Arizona and how Arizona may have avoided, the Arizona Republican Party may have avoided a disaster in the fall uh, and actually moved away from the person who was desperately trying to tie herself to Donald Trump. This is the best possible outcome, Joe, for Republicans. If anyone showed us how to walk this tightrope of trying to not completely embrace Donald Trump, but trying not to alienate him, uh, it was Martha McSally. She did not endorse him when he was running for president, um, but she did not alienate him either. Uh, she at one point called him a friend, and then in the final moments of the campaign, she tightened her position on immigration. And she'll be running against Kirsten Cinema, who is, by all accounts, a moderate uh, part of the Blue Dog Coalition. And I think this race will be a very good test of whether or not someone like Martha McSally can survive, though, in the end, uh, having s somewhat aligned herself with Trump in this race because it is so close. And I think it's going to expose as well, Joe, one of the really undercovered stories of the 2016 election, which was just how close the Democrats came in some of these traditionally red states. In Arizona, Hillary Clinton only lost by about 3.4 percentage points. So if Martha, if their Democrats can do a good job there of tying Martha McSally, uh, despite her efforts to walk that tightrope to Trump and really gin up their turnout, it is possible that they could pull off an upset, even though the prognosticators at this point are still saying that, uh, given the traditional patterns there, McSally may have the early advantage. Early advantage. So, Elise, what, what's your takeaway from the election results? Uh, are you looking at the Florida race and surprise in Florida as... Uh, one of the most interesting races in the fall? Well, clearly the Florida race is fascinating just because you have two young politicians the same age from just the far reaches of both of their parties. So that, of course, is going to definitely be something that I'm excited to sit back and watch and see how it plays out. But also in Arizona, I think that what Representative McSally has done is incredibly interesting. And the fact that she managed to preserve her authenticity and not alienate Trump voters without going too far in the other direction has been somewhat of a model to watch. And so we'll see how that plays out for her, for her in a state that Heidi, as she was explaining, you know, did, isn't as close, uh, isn't as resoundly Republican as it has been in the past. I would, I would say that uh, you can't understate how good a job and how relieved uh, Mitch McConnell and his crew are over this result. It could have been a total disaster. Um, Kelly Ward or Joe Arpaio would have been a surefire loser in that state. 
They swooped in uh, when it became very clear that they had this problem on their hands. They convinced the congresswoman to run. She ended up running a very solid campaign, and they avoided what could have been a Roy Moore situation. Now, I don't know if the seat ends up staying in Republican hands. Uh, it's a very tough race. But uh, Senate Republican leadership has done a decent job, I would argue, since the Alabama debacle in trying to shore up their position. Well, when you look at uh, the contrast with Virginia and Ed Gillespie's race right. and how he came out tarnished from that because that just wasn't who Ed Gillespie was mm -hmm. and voters could sense the inauthenticity. Yeah. Steve, I'm, I'm struck by uh, at least three themes that seem to be consistent in every one of the elections we've held thus far this year. Volatility turnout and Trump. Yeah, it, it, talk about the Trump and volatility factor, too, in Arizona. It, it, it looks like, and it is, like McSally won this thing resoundingly, but if you, if you show those numbers again and you add up the Kelly Ward and Joe Arpaio vote, you're close to 50 percent, and we'll see when all is tallied exactly how close they come there. I think one of the other stories that's emerging here is there was some mystery around the question of why was Joe Arpaio in this race in the first place at 86 years old. You know, he just got pardoned last year. You see 47, 48 percent right there if you add it up right now. Still a considerable amount to come in. There are some indications right now that one of the reasons Arpaio might have gotten in this race is there might have been some folks around him who were on that Trump side of the party who were disgruntled with Kelly Ward. And so what you basically did was you saw a, a perfect split almost right down the middle of the Trump wing of the party right there mm -hmm. that allows McSally to come up and win. It, it is. It's a 24-point margin over Ward. But if you break that down another way, the Trump wing versus the non-Trump wing, you're almost at 50-50 right there. So the, the, the biggest factor, I think, in this race for McSally might have been that Arpaio got in this race, split that Trump vote very well. And you got to say, looking ahead to the general election, uh, Arizona, look, it's been 30 years since they elected a, a Democrat to the U.S. Senate. The most recent polling we have out there, take it for what it's worth, Kirsten Cinema up four points over McSally. So maybe walking into that general election there, certainly in the best position a Democrat's been in, uh, in 30 years. Steve, I, 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 it's certainly hard to project right now, Steve, but in that Florida governor's race, obviously going to be one that's going to be really closely watched across the country. Right now, who would you put as the early favorite in that race? So, uh, th so somebody, believe it or not, two polls this year have been taken in that matchup of, uh, of Gillum versus DeSantis, a very unlikely matchup. The most recent one, I think, was about six weeks ago, and it was 39 to 36 Gillum over DeSantis. I, I mean, look, I think basically you look at the, the very close ties there, the very close association that DeSantis has with Trump, and Democrats think that is the thing that's ultimately going to carry the day for them in 2018. They, you look in 2014 and 2010, Democrats were close to winning the governorship, very close to winning the governorship in Florida. But what did you have in 2014 and 2010? You had midterm environments that were very friendly to the Republican Party. Democrats would say, hey, look, we were close in 2010, close in 2014. Now you got a Rick Scott like candidate in 2018, but you throw in a very different midterm climate. And that Trump baggage, Democrats uh, will say, is going to make the difference for them. Republicans are going to say, hey, look, you know, too far to the left for Gillum and also, I think the wild card here we have to say is nobody was talking about Gillum until 24 hours ago. We're going to find out a lot about him, I think, now that nobody was saying before. Well, and, and boy, Michael, still, you, you have candidates like Gillum coming from right. nowhere, beating other candidates who are tough. He surges ahead to 34 percent. More times than not, candidates like that have history on their side. They have momentum on their side. Uh, and uh, it, it also, that victory, if Gillum runs a strong race, that's very good news for Bill Nelson, who is yeah. struggling in the race of his life right now against Rick yeah. Scott. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gillum could be, have the effect of pulling out a, a lot more of that Democratic vote. In fact, if you peel back a little bit of the numbers, and, and Steve has done a phenomenal job in doing that over the last uh, 18 hours or so, you'll see that the young vote um, turned out, uh, that there was a youth vote, uh, if you will, that, that really f coalesced around Gillum. With that, along with other energies that are cur currently on the ground there in Florida, the anti-Trump feel and all of that, it could be a nice setup where you could have Gillum actually pulling and creating coattails for, for uh, the Democrats up and down the line. But here's the other side of that uh, conversation I think you need to take into account as well. We don't know yet fully what the full measure of the Trump vote is in Florida 
two years later. Uh, and so I think that's going to be something very interesting to watch, too. You'll also have the, the overlay of race. Uh, playing out uh, in Florida, uh, along with uh, the the sort of the philosophical differences, as you, uh, if you will. So there are a lot of dynamics on the ground here that, that are going to be taking shape and forming this race between DeSantis and Gillum, which could have a ripple effect on a bunch of other races as well. Well, we, we need to go with Steve Kornacki. That opens up an important question. Of course, Tim Russert, 2000, talked about Florida, Florida, Florida. Uh, as as the ultimate purple state, the ultimate swing state, uh, and that's what we've believed for a very long time. But Donald Trump shocked the world by winning Florida in 2016. A lot of people surprised and asking me, why is Rick Scott still ahead in Florida in a Senate race mm -hmm. in, in, in a year when Donald Trump uh, is impacting the outcome of races the way he is? And we showed a clip of Puerto Rico, which... Uh, was supposed to bring a lot more Puerto Ricans to central uh, Florida, which was supposed to help uh, Democratic candidates. What's going on in Florida right now? Yeah, no, it, it, this, it, this has been the outlier. You're trying to look at all these competitive Senate races. You look at all of the states that Trump won very closely in 2016, where Democrats are up in 2018. Michigan, Ohio, and Ohio wasn't as close, but Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, right. Wisconsin. The Democratic incumbents for Senate there seem to be in pretty good shape to very good shape. And then you go down to Florida, and as and, you say. And, and, and also, Donald Trump's numbers have just completely nosedive. And, you know, he's got reelects in the low 30s in Wisconsin. In, in Wisconsin Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, and I believe in Ohio, but in Florida, he's still riding high in the mid 40s. Yeah, and, and I think a, a couple things might be going on there. Number one, one thing that I, I think I put a little bit more stock in now, and I didn't at the outset of this race, is a lot of people were measuring Rick Scott against 2010 and 2014 when he eked out wins in governor's races, I think less than 50% there, uh, and then saying, well, you know, in a, in a different midterm climate, now the guy is doomed. Well, I think he became more popular with Florida voters in his second term. So I think that's a factor. Nelson, we got to say, for a senator who's been there for three terms, you know, it's, it's not clear how deep his base of support has ever really been there. He's got some breaks. He's running some favorable years for Democrats. 2000 ended up being a favorable Senate year for them. 2006 was a very favorable Senate year. He drew Catherine Harris as an opponent then. So how tested has he really been? And the other thing is, yeah, Florida, it's a state where I think there's just, and you see this in those, in those turnout numbers for the primary last night. Yeah, Democratic energy and enthusiasm absolutely through the roof last night in that primary. Republican enthusiasm and energy is right there, too. I'll tell you what, you want to try to interpret what Florida could mean nationally? How about this for a possible confusing outcome? What if we wake up after the election and we say, Bill Nelson has been ousted by Rick Scott in the race for U.S. Senate, and the next governor of Florida is Andrew Gillum? Very possible. Right, very possible. We'll see. And still ahead on Morning Joe, in the words of one Republican senator, quote, nothing lasts forever. Some lawmakers are writing off Jeff Sessions while others are rallying around him. Plus, it's not just America's intel community that's heard enough from Devin Nunes. British spies apparently didn't take him seriously enough either to even have an appointment with him when he flew to London to get a briefing. We're going to get that new reporting ahead. You're watching Morning Joe. We'll be right back. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.